that's not going to work anymore. Navigate back there. Bear with me here. I'm just getting some things set up so that you guys can interact with it better. Hmm. I guess we don't need a pen on there. <clears throat> right. So this is going to be the little uh, the pre-gaming before we actually record the episode. And I'm probably sitting pretty far back from the mic. So I'm going to actually just slightly move it towards myself here. Yeah, I'm seeing the levels elevated, so that's good. Yeah, so essentially this is going to be the pre-game stuff. Um, letting people trickle in. Um, that way I'm not just like jumping straight out the gate. Because um, I've never done a podcast. I've listened to a lot of podcasts, so um, this one's going to be a little different. Uh, the hope is eventually if we get enough people listening in, um, we'll have the chat actually part of each episode's recording. And I'll probably, since this is only episode two, I'm tweaking things as we go. I've already tweaked a, a few segments. Um, the first one being uh, adding reviews. So I figured especially since this week the book I'm talking about is a book I haven't read in a long time. Um, I decided I should probably throw in some reviews from like Goodreads or something like that um, talking about the book. Since that's pretty common for a lot of review podcasts that talk about games, movies, etc. They usually in incorporate reviews, so I'll probably throw in a little section there with reviews of the book. Um, and then also talking about what I'm going to do with the book if I decide to get rid of it, whether that's donating it to someone, giving it to someone else, recycling it, um, all sorts of different ways to purge it from the library if it's not going to stay in the library behind me. Um, <coughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I guess... Well, sorry, I'm looking over my notes real quick so I can be ready to um, record. I haven't hit record yet, so we'll do that in just a moment. And I guess it should be noted, um, I probably won't start at 11 for the recorded part of it. We'll do, like I said, pre-game sort of warming up of things um, so that we're not just jumping straight into recording a podcast. That way, if people did want to start to mill about, ask questions, they have the opportunity to do so. Um, also an opportunity for people to, I guess, get familiarized with things. And then I can also let people know when I'm about to start recording on the live stream for the podcast, which also then lets people know I'll probably be turning my head away to look at a script so then I can read off the opening of the podcast accurately. Um, so if I do look away, at least for the first part, once I hit record, hey, create a table made of books, not the end table of contents. Oh, sorry. We're not recording the podcast yet. This is the pregame. This is the warm up phase. Um, and as I said in my um, plug for it, I'm supposed to read everything in an accent or a silly voice. So, Svenny. I think the voice that you have is I'm just going to go with something that I'm comfortable with, and that's going to be uh, Aussie. Create a table made of the books, not the end table of contents. Just an idea of what to do with the old books. Hmm. I guess that is a good idea. Um, I'll probably, I don't know where I'd put that. I guess maybe 
I am working on a um, a shared public like database, like Anthropology Archives. I'm going to do a Google Drive where you're going to have access to a bunch of databases that I've been working on just because I figured it'd be nice to have some open access data from all the stuff that I've been working on, like the lithics analysis projects. Um, uh, I've got a whole compilation of historic records on old piggy bank surveys. So you want to know like how much money someone had saved up in 1932. I've got that in a database too. And then I guess I could add uh, the books that we're talking about on this podcast too, and whether or not we're going to get rid of them. Eventually the long-term plan is to, um, make my Patreon page look nice. And then that way people can just, if they want the book, they can um, become a patron to get a copy of all the old books um, or win, a, win one of them, or I might make some artwork out of them, but we'll get into that in this uh, week's episode. So I'm actually going to hit record and then we're going to get going on the episode. It's only going to be probably about 20 minutes for those of you who tuned in. Um, so if you have questions, as I said, I try to answer all of the questions and I ask or I read all questions and comments in a different accent or voice to spice things up so then it's not just my voice monotonously going on through. So I'm going to hit record and then we're going to do the reading of the text that I have pre-prepared. It's like 30 seconds of text just so you get a primer and then we're going to get into the book. All right, here we go. Hello, and welcome to From the Archives, a short session of podcast. That's not how we want to say it. Originally, it was a short series of sessions, but that's a tongue twister. So we're probably going to change that to a short podcast, uh, talking about uh, a book from my library, why I have it, and why you should read it or shouldn't read it. Uh, I'm Eric Olson, a professor of anthropology at Cuyahoga Community College, and welcome to my library. All episodes are recorded on Twitch at 11 a.m. Eastern. And since I don't know what people in the chat sound like, I promise to read all questions and comments in a different accent or a different voice. If you happen to miss the live stream, that's okay. You can listen to old sessions on SoundCloud at Anthropology Archives. Every session, I ask the following questions of each of the books. How did I get it? Have I read it? What are other people saying about the book? And should I keep it or can it? With that being said, let's pull a book from the shelf. All right, so the book we are talking about today, I don't know if that could be heard on the, the mic. Get some ASMR in here. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, the book we're talking about today is Who Pays by Ernest Greenwood. The book was published in 1934, and it is um, quite pretty on the cover design here. So just to back up, I took a few notes on some things. So I guess the first question to get out of the way It'll be pretty obvious, I guess, on every episode where it's a book I haven't read. Spoiler alert, I guess, to get it straight out of the way. I had not read this book before starting this episode, um, which is one of the impetus for why I wanted to do this podcast is I have all these books on my bookshelf, but I have a propensity to just collect them without necessarily thinking about do I need them or why I have them in the first place. But I started to research why I had this book because... I just had never flipped it open, never bothered reading it, and I started learning a few things about it. Um, the first thing is that it's from Central High Library, so that's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense to most people, but that's the library from the high school that's across the street from the college I went to, the University of Akron. But I don't know if I got this from the university library, who might have acquired it when the old high school was like purging their records, or more likely, I probably picked this up on any of the numerous antique stores around Akron that sell old books like I probably got this for a quarter um, because it's a 1934 copy of a book and the contents of the book aren't exactly a page turner I actually started reading the book and it turns out the book is actually about accidents and safety and it's definitely dated uh, I remember reading the first few pages and it just it sounded topical um, but apparently if you read further on it's it's really about promoting safety like wearing your seat belt obviously this is before seat belts were even a thing uh, so car crashes were causing thousands upon thousands of deaths every year 
and there wasn't really people doing research on it. So this guy, Ernest Greenwood, decided to write a whole book about it. But I'm just going to read you a short snippet of, of one of the passages, because like I said, I didn't read the whole thing. Um, but I was just curious of like, well, what's this book about? Why is it on my shelf? I should probably give it a thorough shakedown. And so I found this part kind of interesting, and it felt like it was topical to January 2021. Yet the so-called organized social movement, in quotes, the effort to teach men, women, and children to use the tools, conveniences, devices, and equipment of modern civilization properly has little to do with that much misunderstood slogan, quote, safety first, as it is frequently interpreted today. God forbid. Taken literally, this slogan is an open invitation to habitual cowardice. Mm, yeesh. That's kind of a, <laughs> a quote that, like I said, seems apropos for January 2021. But then when you flip through it, he actually starts to get into the data of like, well, you should be wearing your seatbelt. Not to say like, you know, safety is a bad thing. He actually spends like 300 plus pages explaining the cost of all that safety. And he also has some really fun things in here that almost make me uh want to keep reading more of it um there's this uh this cartoon in it if i can find it here bear with me a moment it really won't make much sense to the listeners but the people on the live stream will probably appreciate this he's got these cartoons about driving and this is 1934 and this is before i believe actually i should have looked this up when the Wizard of Oz came out, because it's got it's got the Scarecrow, it's got the Tin Man, and it's got the Lion on this cartoon, and how to properly drive. It feels like one of those Disney cartoons that you would have seen um, from like the 1940s and 50s with like Goofy explaining how to drive properly. It's th it's got that kind of a feel to it. Um, but the Wizard of Oz, I believe, came out after this yeah 1939 so this would have been i guess frank l Baum style writing or um, cartoon design and not necessarily reflecting the popularity of the movie at the time because this is this was five years before the movie and he has a couple more like that there's not really a whole lot he kind of tails off after the first hundred pages so it didn't entice me as much i mean he's got a whole chapter on fires which is pretty grisly uh some of the stuff he talks about um like just children burning in a public library kind of thing so not exactly a chipper chipper discussion um <clears throat> but for context uh about the year that this was published i figured i should probably have a little bit of a discussion about the history of when the books were published uh last time the first episode we talked about um guidebook for ohio indian mounds which was in 2001. And I didn't really give a whole lot of context there other than like the authors because it's sort of contemporaneous, but this is far enough back in history. I probably want to give some historical notes. This is about a year after uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, was inaugurated as our 32nd president. This is in the middle of the Great Depression. So obviously it, it talks a lot about, you know, the cost of, of these federal programs and insurance and accidents and so it's highly topical in that regard um as i said other things that are going on it's five years out from the wizard of oz and it is um you know five years five years the opposite direction from um uh, the stock market crash of october 1929 <clears throat> other things to note about the book uh probably the reason i got it was like i said it's got this classic early 20th century um book cover design which is pretty typical of early 20th century books where it's got this sort of um, stenciled uh, flower design and then it's got a solid green cover. I actually have quite a number of books on my bookshelf that are similar to this. Unfortunately, the problem with this style is um, when you put it on the bookshelf, it's, it gets covered up and all you see is the name of the book and then the author and then in this case, the actual like Dewey Decimal numbers on the book itself, which is how you know it's, it's from... Um, a library system and not just a book that was sold for resale value. So I would probably, oh, it's got some more Central High Library stuff stamped on the inside. The other thing that I learned in researching this book is that I'm, we're probably all familiar with the term spine, and this is something I had not realized. Um, there is a term for the opposite side of the spine, the area where all the pages are that in older books you would cut. Um, 
because you can very faintly make out, actually you can't really see that on the live stream, but you can very faintly make it out, it says Central High Library. And I was like, well, what's that called, that section right there? And it's apparently called the Four Edge, F-O-R-E Edge. So I did not know that. That's actually what you call the opposite side of the spine of a book. So there you have it. Um, moving on to the next question, what are other people saying about this book? Well, for that one, it got a little tricky because like I said, this book was published in 1934. This is an original copy from 1934. Um, so I was not gonna find any um, reviews uh, on, actually, I suppose I could have found reviews on Goodreads, but unsurprisingly, a 1934 book about um, accidents and the cost of accidents and insurance claims probably isn't gonna get a whole lot of uh, buzz on Goodreads. So, so unsurprisingly, zero on there. But I was able to locate on the New York Times, a book review from 1934. This book review um, is from November 11th. I believe this is like a week after the book was released because it came out in November of 1934. Uh, this is for a little bit of context about newspapers at the time. Uh, and this is not just the New York Times. This is also like any newspaper from the 30, 1930s or earlier is they've had a really bad habit of not actually crediting their newspaper authors. So, or anyone who is writing for the newspaper. So it would literally just be, um, you have no idea who wrote this book review. I couldn't tell you. It could have been the editor of the New York Times. It could have been some Joe Schmo off of, you know, Broadway. I don't know. So here is the book review. I'm going to read it in full because it's not very long. It was the only one I could find um, for this book. So we're just going to go through and read it. What accidents cost? Who Pays by Ernest Greenwood. 301 pages, Garden City, New York, Doubleday, Thrain and Company. It costs $2. So first off, before I even get any further in this review, in 1934, this book cost more than what I paid for it in like 2010 or whenever I got this book. <laughs> she clearly shows you it was a flying off the shelves there. And I'm just going to move this over to this screen just so I'm not as turned away from the camera. The answer is, to the question, what accidents cost? Everybody, says Mr. Greenwood. His book is about the tremendous costs of accidents, amounting every year to about $10 trillion. The bill, he shows, has to be paid, and he makes it clear that in the economic course of things, that huge sum is assessed upon the populace in general and is met by, and is met by it each individual having to pay his or her own share. Mr. Greenwood's book is a convincing, persuasively presented statement of the situation as concerns accidents of every sort, whether to persons or to property, their causes, their preventability, their economic and personal importance, the measures uh, that can be taken against them. He takes up, phase by phase, the various kinds of accidents, those of transportation, the public highway, in the home, occupational disease, fire, in industry, dealing with their causes, the losses they occasion, the extent to which they are preventable, and other phases of interest. Wow, 1930s book reviews are dry. Although I believe the content of this book is also pretty dry. Um, but we're not done yet. We've still got another paragraph. In the second half of the book, he sets forth the methods and measures available and possible for meeting this overwhelming menace to our civilization. A greater menace and a greater loss, he asserts, and proves, than any war telling about the organized safety movement, the various organizations combining in it, and what each individual and each community can and should do to help cut down the appalling total of accident losses. Mr. Greenwood brings in plenty of authentic facts, as opposed to inauthentic facts in 2021, as we are all way too familiar with, figures and statistics to prove all his assertions, and his argument is interesting and cogent. His book should have the widest possible reading. And that is where I depart with the New York Times editorial um, or book review on this book. I don't think it necessarily needs the widest audience. Who do I think should be reading this? Probably people who have an interest in 1930s history. So if you are a history graduate student, I think this is a relevant book for you. Um, it's probably got a lot of context about what's going on in early 1930s. Great Depression era America, how people are dealing with safety, which obviously has implications for motorists and all that kind of stuff, 
And he's obviously got a few graphs and tables in here. He doesn't really list a whole lot of tabular data. It's in the back. What I find interesting is looking at um, tabular data and just how data is presented and stuff before the computer era. So like before the 80s and 90s, um, just because it's so aesthetically different. Um, like, let me flip here to um, some of these tables. Just the way they present tables, it looks a little different um, than what we're probably more familiar with. And I'm just now realizing this is backwards for people on the live stream, but that's probably okay. Um, because they're not really worried about um, Excel spreadsheets or other spreadsheet applications. So I guess just the way that you visually represent something in an era where spreadsheet applications and computing just doesn't exist. It's kind of interesting um, to think about. I don't know if I'd necessarily say I'd want to have to do it, but it's interesting nonetheless. So I guess the big conclusion that we have here is should I can it or should I keep it? I think at this point I've probably played or showed my hand a little bit, but I'm definitely going to be canning this book. Um, as much as I thought it was interesting and I started reading a little bit more about it, I just can't honestly justify having a book from 1934 about accidents and preventable um, things through safety on my bookshelf. What I'll probably do with this is I won't recycle it. I won't, well, I'll probably recycle some of it. I probably won't gift it to someone unless they really, 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 really want it. Um, but what I'll probably do is I'll cut out some of these fun cartoons because I just like the artwork of these cartoons. And I know that there's a, a small market for people to make these book covers into wallets. In fact, I have um, I have a wallet. I'll have to bring it out for the next ep next week's episode. I have a wallet that's actually made out of um, the cover of an old uh, book, which is pretty fun. So people do fun arts and crafts things with old books and letter design. Um, in fact, I had a friend who did a wedding, um, and she made little roses and other flowers out of paper from old books that were not going to be read anyway. So I'll probably do some for some sort of fun arts and crafts with this book, but honestly, I think its days are numbered. Uh, sadly, it is going to not be on the bookshelf anymore. So that's the conclusion that I'm going to make with this one. Um, and I think that's probably going to do it for today's episode. Um, <clears throat> if you enjoyed this, be sure to like it on SoundCloud and tune in next week at 11 a.m. We're going to do, like I said, the format's a little different. We usually are going to have a few minutes of sort of warm up, uh, talking to people. And before I go, I do have someone posting a, another comment. So I get an opportunity to do a fun voice or accent on this episode. <laughs> so Svenny, who I'm earlier before we started recording the podcast, I used an Australian accent, so I'm going to stick with it, says, we appreciate the thoughts, Ernest, but unfortunately, we're going to have to show you to the can. Apropos, I guess, because I think Australians use can as a trash can, or no, they use bin. That's right, they use bin. Uh, but apropos, yeah, we're showing you the can, Ernest Greenwood. Oh, and I guess I didn't really talk about Ernest Greenwood, um, but he's actually an English guy who moved to the United States and served in Congress for a few years, and then he died of a heart attack. So, <laughs> sorry, Ernest, your book is uh, getting the can. Um, but next week, we will be talking about a different book, probably another historical book. I will try not to know what the book is in advance, so then I don't have too much lead on it. But if you like this, remember to go to SoundCloud. Um, remember to tune in 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Twitch if you want to participate in a live recording of the podcast. And until next time, never stop reading. That book might give me an insight to those times. I might have a go. For, I might have a. Oh, sorry. I just hit stop recording. Oh, no. I don't think I started recording at all. Did I? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to download this from Twitch. That's going to be frustrating. But. Bernardo Mello 1104 says that book might give me an insight into those times. I might have a go of it. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, you could probably pick up any book from the thirties and get insight into the times. Um, suffice to say they didn't have seatbelts. Uh, they also 
didn't have a whole lot of safety regulation. So a lot of people died for needless reasons, um, unfortunately. I mean, the seatbelt was, I think, the 1950s, which I guess in the next subsequent episode, if I do anything historical like this, I should probably do a little bit more research on things like the history of seatbelts and stuff like that, which if that's something that's interesting, I can add to future episodes. Do we... Do we think this book was influ influential on safety? I'm going to guess not because it was really quite hard to find any commentary on it. I couldn't really find any archived documents that really go into depth talking about it. If you go to archive.org, you would find all sorts of stuff, I would presume, digitized that talk about this, Library of Congress, that kind of stuff. But yeah, you would think a book on safety would have a huge readership, but I just think it didn't really get the wide readership it did. A, because of the um, topic. I mean, who's really interested in reading a book about safety, especially in 1934? I mean, I guess they had less opportunities to, they didn't have Apple TV and Hulu and, and Twitch. So there weren't a whole lot of entertainment options, but also $2 was quite a lot of money back then. If we use the Bureau of Labor Statistics... Uh, inflation calculator Bureau of Labor Statistics inflation I think it goes all the way back to the 1930s aha it does so let's see 1934 let's figure out what two dollars would have cost in 1934 in November we can go by month what that would be in December 2020, $38.58. Check out Ernest's Wikipedia page. Yeah, he was a congressman, so presumably he passed some legislation that was relevant to it. Um, oh, yeah, his, his picture is amazing. Um, I don't think it's a different Ernest. I, I truly don't think it's a different Ernest Greenwood. Um, but the picture that he has is... Oh, it's beautiful. I'm going to put probably um, as a background for the episode on SoundCloud, I'm probably going to do um, the backdrop of the cover and then mesh over that uh, the picture of Ernest Greenwood on Wikipedia. It literally looks like he was caught coming out of the bathroom like after a massive dump. <laughs> it's it's bad. And, and what's funny is when I looked him up on the New York Times, that's also the same picture that they used for his obituary. It's it's like they couldn't find a better picture of this poor guy. It's it's bad. <laughs> um, but where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, right. So back to inflation. Um, $2 in November of 1934. So how much this book cost, according to the New York Times book review, that would have cost roughly $38.59 in December of 2020. So I really don't think this book was going to be read by a lot of people if it would have cost 38 bucks to buy a copy of it. This really isn't the uh, Ernest Hemingway, um, John Steinbeck kind of pick it up and read it kind of thing. So I really don't think it would have had a wide readership um, back in the 1930s. So I think that's where we're going to leave it for today. Um, stay tuned at 1 p.m. I'm going to go live and do some lithic illustration. We're going to pick up where I left off, la left off last week um, where I was drawing a large turkey tail. And if you want to see how that goes, just tune in at 1 p.m. from 1 to 4. Hopefully, I don't have any technical issues like I did last week. Um, or at least we shouldn't. But until then, never stop reading.